So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we are also going to continue from where we started yesterday, and uh, today we are going to do what we call terms of movements. These terms of movements, you know, we have discussed some bit of it all the time, and today we are going to digress further about that. So, as you are all aware of that, when we talk about movements, we are talking about, you know, movements of our joints. Of course, movements do not only take place only in the joint. Like the muscles, they also move. They contract. When they contract, it's movement. You get my point. And so, but basically speaking, when we are talking about <clears throat> terms of movement in anatomy, we are only referring to the movements at the joints. So we have about a series of movements that includes what we call flexion and extension. You see, a movement cannot take place without muscle contraction or relaxation. So all this that do happen in any kind of movement, there has to be what? There has to be contractions and relaxations of the muscles. And these contractions and relaxation of the muscles as, are as a result of chemical, you know, reaction taking place, you know, interactions, you know, there are so many muscle fibers that do interact with each other what you call acting a myosin, you are going to do that in physiology, that is on my field. So they're going to tell you how these muscle fibers, you know, the structural and functional unit of a muscle, how the microfilaments, you know, they, they interact with each other and form the contraction. So movements do take place in axes. Singular, we call it axis. So this is axis. So in plural, you put A X E S, axis. So any of this kind of movement that we are going to discuss today must take place in an axis, whether in a vertical axis, horizontal axis, you know, or anterior posterior angle anterior and posterior angle. So all these kind of movements, they do take place between these three major axes. So the movement of flexion and extension is taking place at, at what we call horizontal axis. Let me just give you a typical example of this axis so that probably you may be able to understand if I take this book as my left upper limb, this one, and this is the axis of movement. So let me just try and get a sheet of paper out of that because that would be helpful. That would be simpler for demonstrating. Sorry, I, I have to tell you, you know. So if I assume that this is my upper limb, right? And this is the axis of movement. I take this one as an axis. It can be either vertical, horizontal, or oblique. You get my point? Or the other one, you know, anterior, posterior. So if I now take this one as my left upper limb, this paper is my left upper limb, all right? So now this is my upper limb, like this. So for this, my shoulder joint, to make a movement of flexion like this, an extension of the shoulder joint like this, this paper must move forward, that is flexion and extension. And if you look at this axis, it is lying what? Transversely, that is horizontal axis. So my upper limb is able to make this flexion movement of the shoulder joint and extension of the shoulder joint at this horizontal or transverse axis. That is forward movement and backward movement. That is flexion and extension of the shoulder joint. Similarly, even this elbow joint, if this is my elbow joint, the same thing, this forearm, 
this from here to here was to move it like this. That is anteriorly flexion of the elbow joint and posteriorly that is extension of the elbow joint. The same thing with the wrist. So they all move at the transverse axis. Are you clear? Good. For the movement of this flexion can occur at any where in our body. But once I should also tell you, which I probably have to, the issue of other flexions and extensions with regard to other parts of our body. For example, now, I can clearly try to extend off legs my head and neck. For example, if I do like this, that is flexion of my neck, right? And if, if I do like this, that is extension of my neck. And so this movement takes place at which axis? Is it the same axis or different axis? The same axis. Thank you very much. Because if I assume that this one is my, the, the head is, this is the head and this is the neck. So if, 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 if I want to, this is the head here and this is the neck. If I move the head here, it will come down like this. If I remove the head to take it back like this, to, so it's still the same axis, horizontal axis, right? But again, if I do like this of the neck, that is right-sided flexion of the neck. If I do like this, that is left-sided flexion of the neck. So in this situation, which axis do you think this one can? Sorry? This is lateral. This is right flexion of the neck. This is left flexion of the neck. So which axis do you think this movement takes place? Eh? I just want a very good guess. Probably I may give you an award. Eh? Alima al baraka. Because the thing is that if this is the neck, this is my neck, this one, and this is the axis. So if I want to move my head like this, this the head is above here and the neck is below. So if I, I move the head this side, that is right. If I move it this side, that is left. And so the axis is antero posterior. You have 500 naira. Yes. Exactly. Yes, I told you, I will give you. So now we've seen, because what I, what I was telling you, anatomy is just understanding. If you understand, you don't even need to craft anything. So now I didn't tell you the axis, but the guy was able to derive it based on this simple explanation that we have made. That is that. Similarly, I can also flex my trunk like this, Dororoku. That is flexion of the trunk. If I remove, if I come <coughs> off the ruku like this, that is extension of? So like in our prayers, we also do all this movement, flexion and extension. And again, we can also move our trunk, this side, on the right side. That is flexion of the trunk on the right side and flexion of the trunk on the left side. And still in the same anterior posterior axis. While for the ruku, flexion of the trunk and the extension of the trunk is transverse axis. Do you get my point? But I can still, I can twist my trunk like this. And I can twist it like this. But this is not flexion, right? I can rotate it to the right and I can rotate it to the left, like this. And so this movement takes place where? Vertical axis. Because if this is axis, this is the vertical axis like this, and this is my body. So I can decide to move it this way or this way. And so I'm just moving this way and this way through this vertical axis. So now we have seen that we have various movements of flexion and extension that do take, place, do, do take place at different parts of our body. And we have seen that flexion and extension does not 
only take place on the horizontal axis, but it can also take place in an antero posterior axis. Example, the right or left flexion of the neck or right and left flexion of the trunk. These are all part of the SCQ questions that may come out in examination. You get my point? So I can decide to give you a question like say, flexion and extension takes place only in one of the following axes. E, anterior posterior axis. B, horizontal axis. C, oblique axis. D, A and B. E, none of the above. What is the answer? A and B. A and B. So you have now got it. You have now got it. That is exactly the way it should be. Now we've seen that. Abduction and adduction movement. When we talk about abduction, A, B, this marker is, if we talk about abduction movement, A, B, D, we're talking about subtraction. That means moving away of any part of your body from the center. For example, now, I move my upper limb away from my trunk. That is abduction. And I bring it down towards my trunk. That is adduction. From add, addition. ADD, add. Are you clear? So, adduction means you add that to your part of your body to another part of your body. That is adduction. Bring it back. Adduction. You move it away, that is abduction. So this movement of abduction and adduction take place along which axis? Eh? Eh? Anterior posterior. So now you are getting just because of simple logic that we have done the first time. So if I take this one to be my upper limb, if I want to move this is my body, for example, this is a body. And I want to move this upper limb away from the trunk, I move it this way. And then bring it back this way. This way, this way. So that means this axis is anterior, posterior axis. So the movement of adduction and abduction takes place at the anterior, posterior axis. But do we have Another axis through which the adduction and abduction takes place. Okay, let us see whether it is possible or whether we have it. I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no, but you can tell me that. So, for example, now we have seen that of the upper limb, like this. Um, for the lower limb, like this and like this, the same axis, right? Anterior posterior axis. But for example, now, I'm just standing in an anatomical position, right? So now, see my palm. The palm is just, uh, you know, I adopted my fingers. This is my fingers, they are adopted. And now I abducted the fingers like this. You get my point? So this movement of the fingers away from which axis do they? Eh? So it is the same anterior. So also, if you do it on the toes of your feet, when you just look at your big toe, and then you separate it like this, and so it is. If if you do it like this, the same thing is. Is it the same anterior posterior axis? If you do it on the foot, yes. What is the axis? Eh? Look at it. Suppose that these are your feet on the floor, and then these are your toes, and then you move it like this. Eh? Alima al baraka horizontal. Horizontal. Because now look at it. 
This is the foot. You get it? This is, uh, um, I don't know, this one cannot work. Um, if this is a finger, it's a one finger. Maybe one of the fingers, of the, one, of the, one of the toes of the foot. So you want to move it away from, you know, away from the midline, for example. This is the foot lying flat. So you want to move this finger away. This is one finger. So you want to move it away, and you want to bring it towards. So this is axis. It's lying down like this, and then you move the finger to the right, to, towards the middle, or you move it towards the left. So the fingers will move away from this horizontal axis or towards the center of this axis. So it is moving. The movement of abduction and adduction here is horizontal axis, while on the limbs and on the fingers, if you are in an anatomical position, they are all in antero posterior axis. Do you get my point? But let me tell you something. You people are wrong when you, when you said it moves on the antero posterior diameter if you are in anatomical position. Look at it. Are you correct? See, they are just moving away like this and to us. Eh? Is it horizontal or anthroposterior? Eh? It cannot be anthroposterior. It cannot be anthroposterior. It cannot be vertical. See, horizontal. So it means. The movement of the toes, if you are, if you, if you are feet are on the floor, if your feet are on the floor, the movement of your toes away from the second toe, because the second toe is serving as the axis, mid, mid axis of movement. So that means it is along that horizontal axis. Similarly, when you now stand in an anatomical position, you abduct your, your fingers like this, you know, away from the axis, so it is moving away from the horizontal axis. Are you clear? But if you place them again, still, when you put the palms on the floor of a desk or a table, still the same thing, horizontal axis. Are we now clear? Good. So we have now seen that. So the other movement is what we call internal and external rotation. What do you mean by internal and external rotation? For example, now, if you want to, uh, let me have this chair. Yeah, yeah. For example, now I jo I'm just sitting down on the chair like this, with my legs suspended like this. I'm just sitting down like this. And I want to make an internal or external rotation of my hip joint or my knee joint. If I want to do internal rotation of my hip joint, I'm going to bring it in. That is internal from the word in, I-N, in. So I'm going to bring my hip joint towards the midline. So if I want to do that, I'm going to do like this, so that my, it's very painful, so that my hip will come closer, something like this. So that means this head of the femur will come closer. But if I want to externally rotate it, I can do like this. You get my point? So that the heads will fall apart, they'll be out. When somebody is out, it's external. So that this is external rotation and this is internal rotation of the hip joint. Similarly for the knee joint, the same thing. If I want to bring this, my knee, towards the middle, I do like this. And so the knee is closer here. If I want to externally rotate the knee, I do like this. And then the knee is facing this side. That is external rotation of both the knee and the hip joints. And so, supposing now I'm just sitting down and I'm doing this movement of internal or external rotation. Which axis do you think this movement can take place? Eh? Eh? 
I'm sitting down. Eh? Horizontal. Who's, who among you that say it's horizontal? Let me see your hands. Only one person? Two persons. Okay, okay. Yeah, many. Those who say it's a vertical, how many are they? None. Okay, two people. Those who say anterior posterior. I'm talking about the hip joint. Eh? Antero, antero posterior. Why did you say it's antero posterior? I'm sitting down like this. And so if I want to move it, I do it like this. Or I want to move it out, I do it like, like this. The guy is correct. So it's antero posterior because this limb will swing this side or will swing the other side. So it's antero just like the one we the one we describe for abduction and abduction, it will move here or here. Are you now clear? Yes. Exactly, that's it. So we have now gotten that, and so we have now seen the internal and external rotation. The other one that we are likely going to see now is the medial and lateral rotation. When you want to rotate, for example, you want to rotate your limbs towards the midline or towards or away from the lateral side, uh, away from the midline. Towards the midline, that is what we call medial rotation. Away from the midline, that is what we call lateral rotation. So suppose I now want to move my shoulder joint medially. What do I do? I do like this. You get my point? So I'm bringing the shoulder joint towards the midline. And if I now want to make lateral rotation of the shoulder joint, I do like this. And so this lateral and medial rotation is associated with, the, with, with which kind of movements? Eh? Ah, think well before you say it. Look at it well. Now I'm in neutral position. So I'm now moving the shoulder towards the midline. That is medial rotation of the shoulder. I'm now taking it away from. It's associated with adduction. Medial rotation is now associated with adduction movement. And if I do like this, I'm laterally rotating, it's associated with abduction movement. So what it means is that some of this movement that we are doing do not occur fully. They are associated with other movements. You get my point? What I said is that some of the movements that we do in our body, they do not occur in isolation. They do occur with additional types of movements. Like the way we have seen this internal and external rotation. Are you all clear? Good. So the internal and external rotation can also be similar to what we are going to discuss now. Look at this this way. Like, if I'm just standing in an anatomical position like this, look at my palms. They're just facing you, right? And I just do like this so that my palm faces medially. That is what? That is also medial rotation of the upper limb. And if I do like this, so that the palm faces forward or laterally like this, it's still medial, it's still lateral, it's lateral rotation. And so this movement is taking place at, an, at, at which axis? Vertical axis. Because this one is just moving like this, this side, or this side. So this is the axis of movement. So I'm, this is my palm, like this. And so I'm moving it this way, or this way. And so it is moving this way, or this way. So that is vertical axis. And that is also internal and external rotation. But there is a difference between this movement and the supination 
and foundation that we are going to discuss now, which I didn't write before in this place. So we also have another movement, what we call a uh, supination and pronation. This supination and pronation takes place only at the elbow joint. Only at what? At the elbow joint. There are two specific muscles responsible for this pronation and supination kind of movement. The biceps and supinatal muscles. But the bicep is a powerful supinatal. It's not a supinatal. Supinatal muscle, we will discuss it in the uh, upper limb. From the name supinatal, that means it supinates the elbow joint. But even though it has that name, it's not the most important muscle for supination. The most important muscle of supination is the bicep brachii muscle. You get my point? So, the supination and pronation of the elbow joint is like when you are, your palm is like this, and then you turn like this, so that your palm, your, your, your hand, the dorsum of your hand faces forward. That is pronation. When you now turn your palm to face you, that is pronation. And the way to attest to what is going on, you can catch hold of your forearm like this. And then you do the movement and you feel the movements of the muscles there. You know, the, especially or on the arm, especially the bicep brachii. When you want to do the movement, you will feel the muscle, you know, make a movement. Similarly, on the elbow joint, you know, the incision of the second tooth, you will see if, if you are moving, you will see how the muscles, you know, move. And also, this kind of movement now, the axis of movement is different from all these axes that we have discussed. It is an oblique kind of axis because the radius moves across the ulna itself. The bone of the radius crosses over. So if, if this is radius, this is the radius on the lateral side, this is ulna on the, uh, on the medial side. So when the supination and pronation takes place, something like this happens. Like a crisscross or X. That is exactly what is going on. So you can even compound that from, you, if you do like this, they are parallel. You are an anatomical person, the two bones are parallel. But when you do the supination like this or pronation, the separation or pronation, you will see that one, this, radius that is lying laterally will now come and cross over the ulna itself. That is uh, the function of, that is the movement of supination and pronation. So, another movement that we will discuss is also the movement of inversion and evasion. This movement of evasion and evasion takes place only in the feet. You get my point? We said it only takes place in where? In the feet. Assuming that this is your feet on the floor, these my palms are the feet. You, you get it? So if I now raise, you know, on, on our own feet, each of the foot has a lateral border and a medial border. You understand? And so if I now move the lateral border of any of my feet to face upward like this so that the lateral aspect of my sole of the foot faces laterally. That is the movement of evasion. You get it? So much so that the lateral border faces a little bit off the ground and facing towards the superior aspect. That is what we call evasion movement of the foot. And by the time you now move the lateral border of your foot to face toward the medial side, so that your medial border of the foot faces up and the sole of the foot faces towards the midline, that is what we call inversion movement. And so this inversion and evasion do not take place at the ankle joint. You know, we have discussed ankle joint before, so, but these two movements, somebody would think that they take place at the ankle joint. No, 
they only take place out at, at what we call mid tarsal joints. Mid tarsal joints. You get it. So they will say that the movement of the eversion and eversion take place at the mid tarsal joints, and that is one of the uh, important function of that mid tarsal joints. So we have now seen this. And then the last one is what we call circumduction. Circum what? Circumduction. You get my point? So circumduction is a combination of all the movements, whereby it includes the abduction. If you want to do circumduction with this upper limb, for example, number one, your limb is in neutral position like this. So you want to do swing like this. This is which movement? Media rotation and adduction again. And then you do like this. Abduction and external rotation. And then you do like this. Extension of the shoulder joint. And then you bring it back like this. Flexion of the inch. So you see all the movements are there. So circumduction is combination of all those movements that we have discussed. With the exception of supination and pronation, which we say takes place only in the elbow joint, also the movement of eversion and inversion that only takes place at the foot of the feet. So we have now finished with terms of movement and the axes of movement. What is now then for us is to discuss the planes of sections. You see in anatomy, for you to be able to appreciate we have to be able to, able to appreciate structures in the section where you are dissecting your cadavers. You have to make some sections for you to be able to understand the arrangement of the structures at any particular area of the body or in an organ. So this plane of sections can be on the whole human or or an, or an organ. So you can take an organ and make a cross section using these planes of sections. Or you can section the entire human. Either you divide the human into two halves, maybe at the level of the umbilicus, you use a knife to cut across, and then you have upper half and the lower half of the human being. Or you can divide the human being into two halves right half and the left half are you clear or you may decide to you know transfer i mean obliquely divide the human being into two parts you know oblique half and another oblique half you get my point for example if 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 if, if this is human being this is just a human being like this i can decide to cut it like this obliquely so that i have Offer left half, lower right half, for example. And I may decide also to divide, like I told you, transversely like this, upper half and lower half. And I may also decide to divide that human being into two halves, right half and left half. Are you clear? These are what we call planes of sections. And these planes of sections, the imaginary planes, is just like if you now take a flat of this, assuming that this is a metallic sharp object with a sharp edge here. So I can take this one as a plane, you know? And if I want to cut, you get it? I can cut with a sharp edge like this, so if, if this one can divide me into two, it goes inside. And so to remove the upper half like this, and lower half, this is a horizontal plane of section. If I use this plane, this is a sharp edge, and I cut like this, vertically like this, and this is what we call sagittal plane of section. You get my point? And again, I may decide not to divide the human being into two halves. I may decide to take some portion of it. 
so I can cut across this vertically and remove the upper limb this way. And this is what we call parasagittal plane. Because this parasagittal plane is lying parallel to this imaginary sagittal plane that I used to cut the cut into two halves. You get it? So we have sagittal and parasagittal planes, and they can, you know, they are multiple. You can cut across any portion of the body to, with this parasagittal, you know, imaginary planes. Are you all clear? So how many planes that we do have now? We have horizontal, we have vertical, and then we have parasagittal. Similarly, we have what you call coronal. The coronal can cut across like this, so that it can divide the human being into anterior half and posterior half. You get my point? Yes. And so this is also another plane, what you call coronal plane. So how many planes do we have now? Four. Four. So we can also have oblique, which we have already demonstrated there. So how many do we have now? Five. We have five imaginary planes of sections. This is with regard to the human being, entire human being. So I may decide to take only a limb to cut it across. So I, if I remove this, my upper limb, for example, and I use this plane to cut across the elbow joint, I'm using the horizontal plane. Yes. If I cut it this way, I'm using the vertical plane. If I now cut it obliquely, like this, I'm cutting it obliquely. If I cut it like this, I'm coronal. You get my point? These are the imaginary planes of sections that we do. What are the importance of these planes? The importance of these imaginary planes of sections is for you to be able to visualize the structures of interest at the area of section you are, you are, you are, you are taking. If, for example, I want to know the neurovascular boundaries in the arm, either at the surgical leg of the humerus or at the mid shaft of the humerus or at the lower aspect of the humerus, so I can decide to take a horizontal section of the arm. So if I cut the upper part of the arm like this, I can now see the arrangement of the neurovascular boundaries. If I remove it, I will see how the neurovascular boundaries are arranged. So much so that if I now draw it like this, if this is the, the cut aspect of the limb here, so probably this is the hemorrhage here, and anteriorly here, this is the bicep muscle here, and probably I may have the neurovascular boundaries maybe at the back here, if it is at the middle sharp. So here I may have my brachio, um, uh, profunda brachii artery, and I may also have my radial nerve. You get it at the back of the humerus. And if you come down now, if you cut a section here, the arrangement is not the same. The brachial artery comes anterior like this, instead of at the back. So when you now cut across, if this is the lower aspect here, Probably you are going to see the radial artery maybe at the anterior aspect of the muscle of the bicep brachii. You get it? So the arrangement now differs at each level you cut. You get it? So that is what we mean or the importance of this place of section for you to be able to know the arrangement of the structures at a particular area of interest. The same thing you can do that with an organ. You can take any of our organs, maybe the lungs, the liver, you know, the, any, of this, any of the organs. The brain, you know, you can also cut it using all this, uh, any of these planes. So now we've seen the planes of sections, and what are remaining now is uh, to discuss about what we call abdominal pelvic divisions. You see, the divisions of the abdomen of, and the pelvis is for us also to be able to understand how our internal organs relate to our surface. I said what? How our internal organs relate to our surface, body surface. 
And that is what? Which type of anatomy is that? Surface anatomy. Surface anatomy. And that is why we are dividing this into regions. So the abdominal pelvic divisions can be either in form of what you call quadrants or regions. From the word quadri, quad means four. So you can divide the abdomen and the pelvis into four regions. And you can now take an imaginary line passing vertically through the umbilicus, which is here. If this is the umbilical region here, imagine a sagittal plane or axis passing through the umbilicus or the navel in English. And also imagine a horizontal line or horizontal plane passing across the umbilicus again. So at the end of the day, it divides the abdomen and the pelvis into four parts. What we call right upper quadrant and the left upper quadrant. And also you have what you call right lower quadrant and left lower quadrant. So we have four quadrants. Using how many imaginary lines? Two or imaginary planes, either planes or lines. So all this they pass through the umbilicus. So we have four divisions. That is one. Two, you can divide the abdomen and the pelvis into, you know, uh, into four parts, and I mean nine quadrants. There are about one, two, three, four imaginary planes or lines that we use to divide the abdomen and the pelvis into nine quadrants, sorry, nine regions. We have what we call subcostal plane. This subcostal plane, it passes at the level of the lower aspect of the costal cartilages. If you now put your hands over your thorax like this, and then you go down, at the lower part of the thorax, you are going to feel some curve along either side of your body like this. And that is the, what we call costal cartilages. And so just, you can even put your fingers at the lower aspect of each of these costal cartilages. That is what we call subcostal area. You get my point? So anything below this costal cartilage is what we call subcostal area. So you can imagine a line passing across this cartilages, um, costal uh, cartilages, that is because it is at the level, lower level of this cartilage, that's why it is called subcostal plane. So we have subcostal plane, and then if you now check, you put your fingers across your lower limbs like this, then you move up, you are going to feel some bony structures at the upper port portion of your limb like this. And so this areas are bony, and you can also delineate the topmost part of these bony areas in your lower limb, the highest peak of your, you know, bony part of your lower limb. And that is what we call the iliac crest. And so you imagine a plane passing across this tubercles of the iliac crest, and that is what we call transtubercular plane. So you have a transtubercular plane, and then you also have subcostal plane. And then you also have, you know, we have two clavicles, one on the left, one on the right. And so you can imagine a plane passing across the midpoint of each of these clavicles. That is what you call a midclavicular plane. You understand, which is also parasagittal plane. You get it because it's parallel to this sagittal, I mean, sagittal plane. So you have two midclavicular planes or lines, you have subcostal line or plane, you have transtubercular plane or line, you know, so by so doing, this one, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you have three regions above the subcostal line. On the right hand side, 
Do you have what you call the right hypochondriac region? In the middle line, you have what you call epigastric region. And on the left side, you have left hypochondriac region. Just below the subcostal line and above the transtubacular line, you also have three regions. You have what we call right lumbar region. In the middle, you have the umbilical region. And on the left side, you have the left lumbar region. And just below the transtubacular region, you also have three. On the right side, you have what you call right iliac region. And then in the middle line, you have what you call hypogastric region. And on the left side, you have what you call left iliac region. So you have nine regions. And the purpose of knowing these regions or quadrants is for us to be able to appreciate the structures that relate to each of these places. From the right hypochondriac region here, the structures of importance are, number one, lower part of the lungs, lower part of the right lung, liver, which is located on that right side. You also have the gallbladder located along that side, on the right hypochondriac region. So on the right hypochondriac region, we know that we have liver situated there, lower part of the right lung. We also have the gallbladder located in that right hypochondriac region. In the epigastric region here, we have the lower part of the esophagus, what you call the abdominal esophagus. You have the stomach also located in the epigastric region. You get it? So mainly the major important sector that we find here is the stomach. And that is why when you are feeling hungry, you feel the pain here. Because when somebody has pulsa, you feel the pain here because the stomach is located around this epigastric region. And that is why the pain, you feel it here. You understand? So we have epigastric region here. And then on the left, hypochondriac region here now. We have the spleen and some part of the stomach because the stomach is, it bends like that. So we have the spleen more or less on the light, left hypochondriac region. You get it? And the way you come to the right lumbar region here, you see we have, you know, the, if I draw the cecum here, ascending colon here, you get it, and then the transverse colon here, and then the descending colon here, and then the cerebral colon here, and the rectum here, and then the anal canal. And so this is the stomach, this is the stomach here, like this, and so this is the duodenum coming here like this, and so these are the small intestine like this, and then the small intestine now attaches at the ileocecal junction. And then you have your appendix. You get my point? So here you have your right kidney, and here you have your left kidney like this. And then you have your ureters coming, and then they come down here and enter into the bladder, urinary bladder here. And then it goes out through the penis. This is the penis. And this is the ureter here. Are you clear? So, on the left lumbar region, what you find most is the right kidney. On the right lumbar region, we have the right kidney. We have the right ureter. And the arteries and veins that supply these structures. That means renal artery supplying the kidney. The ureteric artery supplying the ureter. You get it. And the renal vein and the ureteric veins are what I view. And so also you have the ascending colon, taking origin from the cecum and going up there. And here you also have what you call the right hepatic flexure of the ascending and the transverse. So because the ascending colon now curves to continue at the horizontal column. And so you have the right hepatic flexure of the column. We call it right 
a party flag Joe of the colon itself. So you have this right kidney, right ureter, and the vessels and the nerves, and then you also have ascending colon, and then you have the right hepatic flexo, and then you also have some portion of the intestine going in there. So these are some of the structures that we can find in the right lumbar region. And so that is why if somebody has what we call goal, um, what, we, what we call a kidney stones on the right kidney, you feel it around this lumbar region. And because the kidney is located at the back, but still abdominal wall, so you feel the pain at the back, towards the lower part of your back. Because the kidney is located at the back, and it is at the lower aspect lumbar region. And so if somebody has that kidney stone, or urotelic stone, can feel the pain around that side, around the right lumbar you know, region, like that. When you come to the umbilical region here, mostly what you can find here is a coil of the smaller intestine. So mostly you have the coils of the smaller intestine, some aspect of the duodenum, you know, they are all there in the umbilical region. And so when you come to the left lumbar region, what do you have? Left kidney, left ureter, left artery supply, left uh, kidney, left renal artery supply, and the left kidney, <laughs> left ureteric artery supply, and the left ureter, and then you also have the ureter itself, and then you have the descending colon, because this is ascending colon. This is transverse. So the transverse colon is part of the umbilical region. So transverse colon is part of the content of the umbilical region. So here you have the left, on the left, uh, on the left lumbar region, you have what you call the left hepatic flexo of the colon. You have the left kidney. You have the left renal artery. You have the left ureter. You have the left ureteric artery and the vein. And then you have the descending colon descending down. You get my point? So these are the things that one can see if you remove the wall at that side. When you come to the right iliac region, mainly what you are going to find is the cecum. Cecum is the store of the feces, fecal matter, before it ascends up. So it, it condenses there. When, when, once the solid matter comes from the smaller intestine, it deposits in the cecum. Before it, it, when it contracts, it pushes it up. So the feces ascend up, then caps, enters into the transverse colon, hepatic, uh, uh, left, uh, left, 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 uh, left, and then the septum colon, and then comes finally down through the rectum into the anal canal. And then you go to tell it. So now we've seen that we have the cecum, and then we also have the appendix. Appendix can have several <coughs> locations. It, it may descend directly from the cecum. It may be by the right side of the cecum. It may be at the back of the cecum. You hear my point? It has several locations. So now you have the appendix located in the right iliac region, and you have the cecum. You hear my point? And then you also have the iliocecal junction in there. And that is why when somebody has a disease, what we call appendicitis, finally the patient complains of pain in the right iliac region. You understand. But initially, before the pain you know, you know, becomes uh, subsided, it is felt at the level of the umbilicus, what we call a referred pain. We call it what? We call it a referred pain. You get my point? So now we've seen that the right iliac region, we have the appendix, we have the cecum, and then we have the idiosecal junction. And when you come to the hypogastric region here, we have a lot of structures in there. And this one, they vary between man and a woman. In the woman, what we have is the hypogastric region. You all know that the women, they have what? Uterus. 
You get it? Yes. And then they also have the cervix with the fallopian tubes. Fallopian tubes. You get it? So apart from the uterus, you also have upper part of the vagina. Upper part of the vagina is there. And then apart from that, you also have the rectum. Rectum is also in the hypogastric region. And then you also have, you know, veins, arteries supplying these structures, lymphatics, lymph nodes, they are all there in the hypogastric region. If it is a man, okay, again, we have bladder, urinary bladder. You get it? So we have urinary bladder also in the hypogastric region. And these are the major things that we do have there. In a man, the man doesn't have all this. But the man has rectum. If it is the hypogastric region of the man, we have the urinary bladder. You have the rectum. You have the prostate. We have the seminal vesicle. Seminal vesicle in there. You get it? And then again, what else do we have? We have the veins, arteries, lymph nodes, and lymphatics. They are all located in the hypogastric region. So what do we share between men and women in the hypogastric region? We share... We share... Rectum. Rectum, not rectus. Rectum, yes. We share rectum. We share urinary bladder. What do we share again? Arteries, veins, lymphatics, lymph nodes. These are the things that we share between the male and the female. You get my point? So these are the things that we do share. Somebody would ask me what happens to the ovaries of the woman. Because if you can remember during our previous lecture, we talked about the ovaries and the testicles. Our own testicles, they are outside. But for the woman, their own gonads are inside. And so, in this pelvic region, in the hypogastric region, if I clean this diagram like this, I put the uterus here. So the fallopian tubes are here, and the ovaries, uh, so the ovaries are also there in the hypogastric region. You, you, you understand? Yes. So we have the gonads of the woman, there in the hypogastric region. So I have now seen the importance of knowing either the quadrants or the regions of the abdomen and the pelvis. So maybe we have a break now and um, we, um, we ask questions before we finally uh, continue. So it's almost 12 now. Um, so we have, we break. Can I break? We break and uh, we ask questions. Do you have any questions?